Williamsburg Public Affairs presentation. This is Neighborhoods Today. I'm Dick Mahan. The odds are 1 in 120 that your car will be stolen this year. The odds are 2 in 3 that the police will get it back to you. Unfortunately, it will be stripped of its radio, its tires, its battery, and other engine parts. To a thief, there's nothing like a car. It's self-propelled and fully equipped for a fast getaway. We have with us our neighborhoods today Officer Lewis Young, he has worked in this community for 17 years, and we're very happy to have Officer Young in Neighborhoods Today. Welcome to Neighborhoods Today, Officer Young. Thank you, Dick. Right. You know what I thought we would do? We would start off with just covering the basics. What are some of the basic things that we should be doing to prevent a thief from breaking in and stealing our car? Well, Dick, as the operator of a vehicle, uh, certain precautions should be taken. Uh, I would begin by saying that Whenever you're parking your vehicle, you should make uh, some attempt to park your vehicle in a well-lighted area. Also, uh, try to avoid parking your car at the very end of the block. You know, it prevents uh, tow trucks from uh, towing your car if you park somewhere between cars. Uh, I understand. Okay. So it's at the end of the block. Gotcha. Right. One other thing you could do that is uh, <laughs> cost-effective is that you can turn your wheel either to the curb or in the opposite direction. And this uh, makes it somewhat difficult, also very noisy for this car to be towed away. Uh-huh, okay. Okay. Uh, before leaving your vehicle, do not leave any valuables that would be uh, visible to, uh, to a thief. Uh, make sure to lock all windows, doors, make sure that they are secured. Uh, do not leave any kind of uh, identification material in the vehicle. Uh, especially like your driver's license uh, registration card. I know. So sometimes they say to leave in your insurance card. That's well, that's okay, the insurance right. card. Right. But uh, as far as the driver's license, there is no need for you to leave it in the vehicle. Okay. Or the registration okay. card, there's no need for you to leave it right. in the vehicle. Very good point. Uh, one other thing is if you're going to park your car in a commercial lot yes. where uh, there is an attendant to uh, park your car or you have access to your car, I suggest that you leave only one key, and that's the key for the ignition. Do not leave the key for your trunk, your key for uh, the glove compartment. Do not leave uh, door keys to your home or any other key. Okay. It's not important to the attendant. All he needs is the key for the uh, ignition. That way you can move the car uh, whenever it's necessary. Uh -huh. Very, very good point. Do you know, I had, I had my car stolen uh, two years ago, okay, and it's impossible for people to have a Wells Fargo security agent watching everybody's vehicle, okay. What are some of the devices, I know that there are many on the market, what are some of the devices that one can put on to make his car more secure? Some of the most uh, inexpensive devices uh, to be considered is uh, the bar that can be uh, mounted onto the steering wheel. Uh, this prevents uh, steering of the car if uh, this bar is, is mounted. Uh, there is also uh, another device that you can use to uh, lock the gear shift. That's if you have the type of vehicle with the gear shift on the floor. Uh -huh. uh, they have uh, collars that goes around the uh, ignition locking device and this prevents uh, them breaking the, uh, the lock. Mm -hmm. uh, this device uses a padlock to secure it. Uh -huh. And there might be others uh, other uh, type of uh, security devices out on the market. There are several things that can be used. It's recommended that you should use at least two different types of uh, security system or devices. Uh -huh. What does the thief look for when he is out on the prowl looking to steal a car? Well, he looks for, uh, he's looking for alarm system. He's looking for uh, some kind of uh, mechanical security device. Uh, the car that does not have it, that is not apparently secured, that's most likely the car that he will target uh -huh. because the ones that 
have the alarms uh, or any kind of a security uh, devices, it's obvious that he has his work cut out for him, and I think you would much rather choose uh, the, the easier mark. Uh-huh, okay. You know what I understand is that sometimes there's a scam that can be played, that even if you're in the car, you can have, have it stolen. Do you have some help for us in that area? Yes, it came to my attention a few times in the past where uh, the, the occupant of a vehicle was approached by an unknown person which uh, would tell them that uh, they had a flat tire. And uh, the occupant would exit the vehicle leaving valuables on, 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 on the seat of the car. Right. And apparently this same person, or working in, 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 in concert with another, would uh, enter your car and remove your property without your knowledge. Uh -huh. So I would suggest that uh, if you have to exit your car for any reason, secure the property in the car, you can put it in the trunk or take it with you. Uh, excellent point. Very, very good. I could see how that could happen. That'd be a wonderful ploy. Uh, I understand that there's a program out that the police department has set up, and uh, it's, it's uh, the CAT program. Could you explain a little bit about the CAT program? Yeah, we call it CAT for short, but actually the name of it is Combat Order Theft. Uh -huh. And uh, the, 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 the program works by you coming in and signing an affidavit, giving the police department permission to, uh, to stop your vehicle whenever observed between the hours of 1 and 5 in the morning. Ah, uh -huh. okay. Uh, it's free of charge. All you, all you would have to do is go to your local precinct, the 94 precinct, and uh, or contact your uh, crime prevention officer. Very good. I, I think we've covered a number of things uh, this evening, and it's been it's going to be very very helpful for our viewers. All right, and and we'd like to thank you very much, Officer Young, for being here tonight with Neighborhoods Today and sharing some of your experience with us and making us a little bit smarter about how to protect our car. Thank you very much. Great to have you. Thank you. Neighborhoods Today will be right back, and you'll find out if real men really eat quiche. These are teachers, but to the kids they've reached, they're heroes. Be a teacher. Be a hero. Call 1-800-45-TEACH. Many of us are concerned with the increase of crime in our neighborhoods. And is the criminal justice system really working for us? Rena Marie Peltz is here with Dr. Leon Nadrowski for his views on this issue. Most of you are familiar with our medical reporter, Dr. Leon Nadrowski. What you might not know is that he's also the Republican district leader for the Greenpoint, Williamsburg, and Fort Greene communities here in Brooklyn. Well, Neighborhoods Today has decided to turn the table, so to speak, and Dr. Leon Nadrowski has agreed to join me here on Neighborhoods Today to talk about politics, in particular crime, punishment, and the death penalty. Dr. Nadrowski, thank you for joining me. Thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to be back on Neighborhoods Today. Absolutely, only now the tables are turned. Yes. Well, let's get right down to the issues here. I mentioned the uh, death penalty. You stated that you are an advocate of the death penalty, especially for middlemen drug traffickers. Can you tell us why you feel like that, especially as a medical profession, when you take an oath to preserve life? Yes. The drug scourge has grown so m tremendously that we're really, uh, unfortunately facing even a worsening situation where we'll, we'll resemble Colombia. My point for the dead point penalty is this. Interdiction, where we spent $70 billion, hasn't worked. And if that hasn't worked, what has worked? Education is not exclusive in working. It's good, and we have to continue that. What else is there? Rehabilitation, surely. There's no doubt. But that is not really the answer. The answer is, how do we get rid of those fellows who are killing people on the streets? The death penalty to the drug traffickers must be instituted. We have, uh, in China, in Shanghai, in Singapore, and in Malaysia, a death penalty for drug traffickers. And it's extremely successful. Why can't we implement it? And I think we ought to, in order to win the war on drugs, if we really want to. And we have to. We have no other choice. Mm -hmm. What about our justice system, sentencing parole? Parole system has not worked. If you look at the statistics, those who are on parole 80% of those on parole recommit crimes within six years. And as for our system itself, let's say prison system and also our probation system, we have now 60,000 plus criminals on probation. 30% of them are violent criminals. They should never have been removed from prison. They're really 
even the police department said they're violent criminals and they should be in prison. And we have a prison system that really never punished anybody. Here we have uh, all of the things that many people don't have, television, cable, movies, ballpark, etc. And what I saw on 60 Minutes was a horrendous thing where inmates stab each other. They stab the correction officers. What we have to have, and this is very important, a prison reform where we put each prisoner in one room. Have a single room for each prisoner and bring meals to them, have air conditioning brought in in the summer and heat in the winter, better than the homeless, and no radio, uh, no TV, no movies, no ballpark, 23 hours in that room, one hour of exercise. And when you look at that, that's real punishment. And you give them a Bible and you give them a dictionary and let them learn uh, let them learn to sort of get their degrees in high school diplomas or college diplomas. And that's the way we really should punish them because we haven't punished them correctly in the past. Do you think that kind of punishment really works? I mean, we're talking about pe people, many of whom will probably be out on, out on the street once again. Are we... Well, that's another failure too, Rena. What you said, out on the street soon. What we have now, arbitrarily, we have certain numbers for certain crimes. And those are so such low numbers that we have um, right now, if we quadrupled, quadruple whatever sentencing we have for each, each criminal, then we would have really proper punishment. It's because we had lenient sentences that we have prisons filled today. We have to make the prisoner think twice about going back and give them long sentences and properly put them in prison and treat them as a prisoner rather than giving all of these luxuries that, they, that we have today. Well then, so what do we do though with people who ultimately do leave prison and now they're out on the street? What, what do they have to look forward to in terms of if they've not had any kind of rehabilitation? The rehabilitation is educating themselves. And we've had one fellow who graduated from, uh, let's say, having a, one of those correspondence courses for college. We complimented him for getting such good grades. And we asked him what kind of a problem they were. He was asked what kind of a problem he had in prison. He said, I couldn't study because of the miserable noise of radios. Now, why can't everybody get their high school diploma or college diploma and educate themselves while they're in prison? And they should. That's the way to do it. Otherwise, what we're doing now is a disaster. And like I said, probation uh, is, a, is, is, a, is a disaster, too, because we have 30% of those on probation who are violent criminals. And I might mention also as how bad the drug scourge is. And this was just, just, just uh, described just recently in the papers. A special group described that there are 800 people die of overdose in the emergency room a year, last year. 25,000 go into hospitals for treatment. And there are actually 500,000 cocaine addicts and 250,000 heroin addicts in our city. This is a horrendous problem. We've got to resolve it with changing our criminal justice system in the manner that I just mentioned. Okay, unfortunately we're running out of time. We've got to wrap up. Make me one promise that you come back and we can continue this conversation. Thank you, Rena. I will and thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Now let's move on to Chef Ralph Lapoli of Fanciful Feastings as he shows us how to prepare quiche. There are some foods that go in style, go out of style, uh, are fashionable to eat, are not fashionable to eat. What we're going to do today is something that is completely out of fashion, completely out of fashion, but tastes so good that you really should know how to do it. <clears throat> it's a quiche Lorraine. And this one was baked in the shop and brought over, and unfortunately it fell. Uh, so what we did was take a doily and put it on the bottom of it, uh, but it's not going to harm any of the taste. It is a classic French pie uh, from the province of Lorraine, uh, and it's very easy to make, um, and it's absolutely wonderful with a salad and, and all of that. So why don't we get to, to making it? The first thing you need to do <clears throat> is to preheat your oven to 375 degrees. I take a baking pan and cover it with aluminum foil with the uh, uh, shiny side up because we want the heat 
to um, radiate. Okay, so we put that in the 375 degree oven and we get a pie shell. Now I choose to buy them, I think it's easier. Uh, and just use it the way it is. We have a cup and a half of grated imported Swiss cheese to which I have a few grains of nutmeg. You don't want um, too much nutmeg, but it does pick up the flavor. You're in the kitchen alone, remember that. Then we have for a true quiche Lorraine, we have a half a pound of bacon, which I fried until crisp and I'm pouring it over here. Now at this point, if you choose to do a vegetable quiche, you can use a zucchini sliced up, sauteed, and then put here. You can put spinach that's been cooked and sauteed a bit. Any vegetable, any kind of pieces of ham, um, any kind of meat that you have left over, you can put in to the quiche. And you can make any kind of quiche, a fish quiche uh, with shrimp or whatever. Then what we need to do is make a simple custard. And this again is very, very simple. The rule here is that you use one egg for every half cup of liquid. I always use heavy cream. You can use milk if you want to cut down on some of the calories, but believe me, it's not going to taste the same. Do not, I emphasize, do not try this with skim milk because it will just not work properly. And all you do is beat up your eggs. I don't put any salt in this because I feel that the bacon and the cheese have enough salt. And a cup and a half of heavy cream one of these little half pints is a cup. So that, you know, will give you a good guide. Beat that up. There's been much, much controversy about quiche over the years. And last year, a book, last year or the year before, a book was written, Do Real Men Eat Quiche? Well, I'll let you make up your mind. Now, we go to the oven, and I suggest you do this when it's in the oven. You put this on the hot, hot plate, and that's going to help the bottom cook. And all you do is pour over the custard. And you slip that into the oven and you allow it to cook for about 40 minutes. Check it to make sure that the uh, center is pretty firm, you know, when you test it with a, uh, uh, a toothpick or something. And you just slip it in. Be careful not to spill it, that's the hardest part. And then after 40 minutes, you take it out and you have a wonderful, it'll be nice and puffy. And then after a while, it'll just settle down. And what you do, if you want, you can make it in advance, freeze it, wrap it and freeze it, take it out uh, before uh, you want to serve it, leave it in the refrigerator, defrost it, then reheat it. Or you can serve it cold. May I have those plates, please? We have a little gremlin down here who's helping me. And the forks, thank you, and the serving piece. Okay, and I'm going to show you what that looks like. You can also buy a quiche pan, which is a round pan that has a fluted edge, and if you wanted to make your own um, mixture. But with a salad or a vegetable, that's a great luncheon dish. Thank you for joining me. If you want the recipe, please send a, sa a stamped self-addressed envelope to the address you see to Neighborhoods Today, to, your, to the address you see on, the ca on camera, and we'll be delighted to send you a recipe. Bon appetit. Eat well. Thank you. Now you stay tuned because I'm sure you're going to want to see my surprise guest.
Neighborhoods Today will continue right after this message. It's easy to find my little girl laid down in her home. A lot easier than where you want to be. Dr. Nadrowski is here now for the next edition of Health Update. Alcoholism is one of the leading illnesses in our society today. And more than half the homeless people living on city streets are there because they are suffering from this disease. In this segment, we will introduce you to Gail, a recovering alcoholic, to learn how she is facing a problem and helping others face theirs. Hi everybody, my name is Gail and I am a happy and a grateful alcoholic. I'm holding a coin in front of me that says AA. That's Alcoholics Anonymous and to me it means alive again. And it says a day at a time. That's the way we do things in the program, one day at a time. I drank for 20 years. I lived in the street for eight months. When I lived there, I scrounged for food. I also drank in the street. When I drank, that was my love, that was everything to me. I met people who drank the way I did. And we slept in parks, rooftop landings, hospitals, boardwalk, anywhere I put my head down was home. I had keys, but I never had a place to put them in tow when I was out there. I didn't like it out there that much, but I had no choice in the matter. Of course, we couldn't pay our rent and, and we drank so much so we got thrown out of our building. There are millions of people just like Gail. If you or someone you know feel you may have an alcohol problem, don't hesitate in seeing your doctor or one of the many organizations available for help. So without further ado, our surprise guest, and what a pleasure it is, believe me, is Sweet Frankie C. and the Deaf Troop. Cool. How are we doing, guys? All right. <laughs> yeah, it's truly really a surprise. I didn't even know we'd be here tonight. Okay, what we're going to do is why don't we just uh, introduce ourselves to the viewers and tell basically the role that you play in the band. Okay. I'll start out. Um, mm -hmm. Sweet Frankie C., Frankie Costantino. I play lead guitar and lead vocals in the band. Great. I'm Dan Gewertz. I play the bass and I play guitar. I do a little bit of background vocals as well. All right. I'm Mike McLaughlin. I play keyboards and I sing. All right. Chris Roach. I play drums and a little bit of xylophone on the side. Okay. All right. Now that we have our introductions over with, uh, this band, they do all original material. Uh, so what I like, I think I'll mm -hmm. direct this to you, Frank. How would you describe the music? Okay, it is original rock and roll, um, mm -hmm. uh, very diverse as far as the sound of the band is concerned, because we all have different backgrounds. Um, my particular influences include my brother as a songwriter, certainly, uh, showing me how to write songs and get your emotions out in music. Um, he inf affected me a great deal with my music and my writing, and that oh. comes through in the band. And let's see, any major influences as a bass player? Bass player, okay. right. Well, I, I, um, I do derive a lot of my, uh, a lot of my musical influence from uh, like Getty Lee, uh, John N. Twistle, people who are guys who were popular in the you know, late 60s throughout the mid 70s, um, Paul McCartney, who I feel is kind of underrated as a bass player, and uh, also a little bit of classical background that I kind of use it, you know, from time to time in the music. 60s, great role yeah. models. Here we go. Mike. Uh, my musical influence, uh, I've only been playing for about two years, uh, you know, like this with, with, with other musicians. Uh, I love Roy Orbison lyrics. And uh, really, Gregarian chants is really something that has made a big impression on me. Uh, my 13 years in the Himalayas is very important, and they were mm -hmm. great years of my life, Angel. I, that's really good. I would imagine it's they great would to be, be back yeah. with everybody. We're alive, right? <laughs> <laughs> we are. We're okay. All friends, too, and and now important. we have our drummer here. I let's was going to say Gregorian chants, but oh. now I can't say that. So oh, I'll have all right. To say, uh, well, let's see. Uh, seriously, though, Frank has been a big influence on me as far as this band is concerned, and uh, through his brother, also Frank's influences of. John Cougar, um, Mellencamp, uh, John Fogarty. I also my stage show is based almost ninety percent on what Inkelbert Hump Humperdinck does. Oh, on okay. Stage. Now, uh, Quality. 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 now I, I'm just going to turn this next question over to Mike. Besides being a stand-up comedian, and rightly he so. also <laughs> is the writer of our new theme song. So, you know, maybe you can uh, give us a little bit. Like, was there any secret story that went on behind the writing of this song? Uh, yes. Any, it's, you know, uh, love and lost, and you know. 
Well, it, it, love there's two there, answers to that. Know, First yeah. off, uh, it, I, I wish there was sort of romantic <laughs> um, thing. I'd like to give my address and phone number at the end of the gig, but that's on another show. Uh, second of all, uh, we all write stuff. Uh, uh -huh. This one is in particular I was able to get in and, uh, and bend everybody's arms to let us do this, but uh, okay. obviously Frank, Danny, and, and Chris, we all write stuff. This one, I found some good chords. Uh, I just tried to write something that sounded nice, uh, a little sappy, but it comes together very nice. Well, it we sounded it. especially nice to the producers and you will of hear our the show. instrumental version since oh. it's the theme of this thing. Oh, right. There right. are words to it. There right? are all words. And if we and if you buy the tape, and we sing it in uh, Greek too for the everyone tape, locally which, in Australia, which we're going to Stop right now because right I was going to ask the guys what's coming up, but they have it. They're way ahead of me on this right. one. This is the new Frankie C and the Deaf Troops um, cassette. It will be available in local record shops or if you see them play. And of course, you could always write to Neighborhoods Today. And of course, on this, we have the Neighborhoods Today theme song right. with the words. So that we will see if there's some story behind it's this. It's in Gregorian, too. Okay. And speaking of neighborhoods, we'd like to thank Angel <laughs> and everyone here at Neighborhoods. Uh, Fellas, let's hear it up oh, it's, it, Believe me, it is our Excellent. pleasure. But wait, we're not done yet. There's As more. a very added treat. We are now going to see the new Frankie C and the Deaf Troops uh, video. Uh, of course, with the Neighborhoods Today theme title, guys, I'll, I'll Be, be the, the One. one.